Hi everyone, it's Mrs. Van, Van Star, your friendly neighborhood English teacher, here with part three of His Majesty's Dragon. Super, super, super excited. Okay, so you guys, I loved these chapters and I hope you did too. I shouldn't have even said that because I'm going to ask you to say something about them. But the first question I have for you is, what has surprised you so far? Like, what have you been like, oh, I didn't see where that was going. Um, like maybe a character who went a different way or a plot turn or somebody who behaved in a different way or out of character or something, a realization that you had. What's something that it has surprised you so far um, in the novel? And I'll be watching for those answers to come in. And then, and then my normal one through five. How did how did you like these chapters? There's a crevasse. Okay. Okay. See what you have to say about that. And well, oh yeah, I see. Mr. Van Star just told me that I have the crop bar. I had a little bit of issue with the um, the webcam earlier, so that might be doing it. So there we go. All right. So, oh, I'm seeing it come in. Yeah, Rankin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that, what? Yeah. Okay. I'm in agreement with y'all. <laughs> I'm in total agreement with you guys. Rankin. Yeah. Rankin and Catherine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Catherine. Yeah, that's a big one. We're going to get there. Uh, what surprised me also is when the other train dragons also wanted that. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice. Um. Okay, so cool. <laughs> yeah, you guys, yeah, the, I think there were some surprises and nice to see that you like these chapters as well. Okay, so some shout outs from last week. Um, so I was really happy to see some of the shout outs for Mr. Van Star. And um, this was just one of them. There was a little series of it. And um, so I thought I'd throw in this. So this is me and Mr. Van Star. And I'll tell you just a little bit about him. So we've been married a really long time. He's laughing over here right now. But we've been married a super long time. He is Australian. He's from Sydney, Australia. Little town, um, it, like in the Sydney area called Hurstville, where he grew up and went to school and, co and college and everything there. And we met in Germany. We were both in Germany. And that's where we met. And so he speaks German and I speak terrible German. And... He is a software developer, and he takes his lunch hour every Wednesday to do this moderation. And when we were doing the short stories, he did it every single day. And um, he plays the piano and the guitar. And like me, we're super, super active in our church. And um, so he's a super great guy. And we have all boys except um, girls uh, that we're getting as granddaughters. We have, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but we have a brand new baby granddaughter. Oops, it went black. Um, her name is Paisley and she was just born a week ago. And so we have all boys ourselves, but now our boys are having girls. So it's super fun. And he is a great dad and a great granddad. So I love Mr. Van too. All right. So you guys did a really good job of, um, picking out the qualities of will. Um, and of William Lawrence. And I was very impressed with how you very early on in the book, you captured what he is and who he is and, and how he works. And that is an important thing to do because it's going to inform how you view him through the story. Like every action he takes, you start kind of comparing it to what you think about him and what you do. So that was nice. Christine had asked, can paintings can go on tour? And so I went and looked up how that works. And yeah, I mean, it, it happens all the time. I went and tried to find some examples of them. So museums will send certain of their paintings out on tour to other museums. It's called an, an exhibition or an exhibit. And so like our, my um, museum that I go to the most often here in my area is called the Kimball. And the Kimball will have like Matisse Picasso exhibit from maybe different museums or maybe all from a particular museum. And there are wonderful museums all around the world and they send ex 
exhibits around so that people around the world can view them. The first one I ever remember going to, my mom took me to a Monet exhibit at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Southern California, where I'm from. And then Mark C. asked, were you in one of the armed services? And yes, yes, indeed, I was. I was in the Army. I was an intelligence analyst in the Army, and my youngest son is an officer in the Army, and he is also an intelligence analyst. So um, super, super, super cool. Uh, and that is him with his wife, and he is um, a lieutenant in the Army. And then uh, Cloudfall gave me, like, recognized that I created a hashtag, which uh, I was super excited to see Cookie do the hashtags this morning, and really exciting. <laughs> we all love the hashtags. Even uh, Mr. Vanstar was like, where are the hashtags? <laughs> Here they came. So that was uh, my contribution. And then Griffin said, it's interesting to see the difference of normal manners between the two parts of the army. And, and he meant of the, of the military, right? So we saw the aerial corps, which they just call the corps in the story, and then the navy. And they were very different in their manners. And I loved this quote because that showed that you were paying attention to not only what was happening, but to the dynamics around what was happening. So good, good, good job. Okay. And then... <laughs> the keeper of the hashtags, right? So, uh, the my my favorite that it, I did not include on here is leech of despair. And so, one of the things that I want to do is, um, I want to know, be ready, be ready, because next week I'm going to ask everybody to vote on the hashtag of the series. So, not just this novel, not just. Um, my side of the mountain, but all the short stories as well. Um, what is our favorite hashtag? What is our favorite hashtag? So, um, yeah, I love some of these. I just love. Um, oh, I tried to, I can see I kind of messed up. I tried to make it so I wasn't catch, cutting any of them off. And then um, this shout out to Cloudfall for um, the, the Syringus, my Syringus puppet. That, um, and so I, was, I really love the name. It's, I've, I like it even more. It's just totally growing on me. And um, so thank you for that. And I'm so happy that it was somebody who has been participating all along. And it's super, super good. Um, I hope your favorite hashtag is an English teacher fail. Although I'm fine with it if it is. Um, so one of you... Um, oh, Actually, it was a parent of one of you who the parent's been watching too, sent this in a couple weeks ago to me. And it is a, a infographic, essentially, of Napoleon's march to Moscow. And I thought it was super cool. And um, they said they have it hanging on their wall. And so I was like, ooh, let me go, um, let me go look into this and let me just answer something I've seen in the chat. Is that a bowl of lemons behind it? And he's talking about the picture of Serignus. Yes, I put him on my kitchen table and took a picture of him. That that picture that you saw of him is my kitchen table. So it has this bowl that my friend Jan, who passed away of brain cancer, but she gave me that bowl um, and it sits on my kitchen table. So I went and looked this up and it was super interesting. She said that she and her husband, that it's been hanging, it, I think it belongs to her husband, but it's been hanging on their wall for like 18 years. And I thought that's really interesting. And she sent it to me because she said that it does exactly what Napoleon said, that a sketch is better than a speech. And so I thought it was fascinating. I looked it up and it has been called the greatest statistical graphic ever drawn. And it was done um, in a long, long time ago. And the a guy who did it, his last name was Menard. And it said, this is what it says about it. It depicts Napoleon's army departing the Polish-Russian border. A thick band illustrates the size of his army at specific geographic points during their advance and their retreat. It displays six types of data in two dimensions. It has the number of Napoleon's troops, the distance traveled, the temperature, the latitude and longitude, the distance of travel, and the location relative to specific dates without making mention of Napoleon. His interest lay with the travails and sacrifices of the soldiers. 
and it has come to be called this illustration of flows has come to be called a Sankey diagram. And um, so anyway, I thought that was super, super, super cool. Super cool. So thanks for sending that in. And then our very own Deb Michael Coleman uh, took maps and he l plotted out the path of um, of our characters, of Temeraire and Lawrence as they went from, so on the right over here, you could see where they're like found off in the, he's found off in the ocean where they run into the Amity and then they go back up and they end up going to, and now we're in England, right? So we can come down here. They go to England. Coatney, not Coleman. Coleman. What did I say? Coatney. Coatney. No, I said Coleman, yeah. but I meant Coatney. Sorry. I know who it is. <laughs> I just don't always say what I mean. Um, so they get to England and they go up to his family's house, which we discussed last week was a real place. And then from there up to Ed up to Loch Logan and then to Edinburgh and back. So that's why that line is thicker, right? Because this is a one-way line and this is a two-way line. So I thought that was super cool. And now at the end of these chapters, we actually have another another one. Oops, let me go back. Because at the end of these chapters, he's, they're going to go from here down past where they went before all the way down to here to Dover, which we're going to see. So thank you for that, Michael. Looks super cool. All right. Ready to dive in? Ready to dive in? Okay, so here are the key events, I think, in the chapter. So you guys put your thinking hats on and decide, is this, um, is, do you agree? Is there anything you think I left out that was important? Now, of course, I can't capture every single thing that happens, and that's what I'm not trying to. But what I'm trying to do here is say, this is what I think was important in these um, chapters that we read. These three chapters, what do you think was important? Okay, so I think it's important that he meets Rankin. I think it's important that he's assigned to the formation. Um, the, re the rescue of Victoriatus, the reconciliation with Granby, the arrival of um, Choiseul, the, the French guy that then tells him we're, we're off, right? And then they leave to go to battle. So that to me um, should be, that, that to me was what was important. I'm curious if any of you have anything different that you'd like to add or anything you think I should have taken out. All right, so let's jump into chapter six. He says, and this this character... This guy's a nice guy, right? I, do you guys like this guy? I like this guy. Um, he's he's kind of gruff, but he's he's um, he's got this. Um, he, he's got something about him. I don't know. I just like him. I just like him. Um, and oh, I would say that they in the book it's spelled B E R, but I know from a a mini series and a book that I like about England, about London, that, that they would pronounce it Barkley, even though I would pronounce it Berkeley. Um, so I'm looking to see discovering that Levitus was Rankin's dragon. Oh, Mark C. Yes. Making their own maneuvers. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's good. Nobody likes Rankin. Yeah. What, Andrew? Rankin is not okay. <laughs> Rankin is not okay. We need a hashtag, Cookie Cookie. We need a hashtag. Rankin is not okay. All right. But, you know, it, everybody needs some friend. So thank you for being the friend because nobody else is willing to be Rankin's friend. So I loved this idea, though, in here that that once, once somebody knows it's possible, then they want it. My husband taught me this, uh, Mr. Van Star taught me this saying that um, a luxury once experienced becomes a necessity. And I think that that is going on here. Um, and then he says, Barkley scowled at him fiercely, then abruptly he snorted. He nodded, apparently in all friendliness, and left. And I just feel like this is another good example of the character characterization that we talked about two classes ago and how things that the author has other people do and say and then we interpret what they're like and we really get a feel here that he's like this just gruff character but underneath it all there's this um this underlying goodwill and their relationship gets off to kind of this rocky start but then when Lawrence challenges him right back and Barkley sees that he can take it, then it just smooths everything over. And that kind of reminded me of a moment in 
on my side of the mountain. And I, it reminded me of a moment in my side of the mountain. And I'm going to give you guys a chance to see if you rem can think of a moment in my side of the mountain that this might have reminded me of this, a, a relationship getting off to a rocky start with almost a disagreement or argument. And then the person fights back and then they're all friends again. So I'll be watching for that to come through in the chat. And then when um, this scene, when um, the dragon Maximus, I think it, when Maximus flies right at Temeraire and Temeraire like stops in the air and just suspends himself and holds himself straight in the air. And everybody is like, whoa, mind blown. I need like hashtag dragon tricks, right? Like, whoa, what's going on? Dragon maneuver. And um, they... And then they ask, like, oh, can he do this? Like, how long has he been able to do this? How did he learn this? How did he get this? And Will's like, oh, I never really gave it much thought. And, um, oh, I'm waiting to see. Let's see. The, okay, I, I'm pausing on this to go look at what you guys say about the scene in My Side of the Mountain. Um, oh, Leech of Despair. Oh, I love that one. Okay, The Bowling Kid, Mark C., you got it. When he meets the bowling kid and he says, oh, I we never even got in a fight. And usually when I make a friend, we get in a fight and then it's okay. And we talked about that. That was what I was thinking of. I think some of you guys are catching on. Like Kira says, it's kind of like the Baron Weasel. And I think that's true too. That's true too. Okay, so I love this part. And then he says, and they ask, um, and this is, uh, Solaritus says, and Will's like, oh, is that unusual that a dragon can do that? Like, just stay suspended in motion? And he says, oh, is it unusual? Well, only in the sense of it being entirely unique in my 200 years experience. And so this is verbal irony. A little verbal irony there going on. A little dry wit. A little sarcasm from Solaritus. You know, Solaritus is a very well-developed character. Um, so that's kind of interesting. All right, dragon hummingbird. Ooh, that's cool. That's cool. Yes. Yes, cookie, cookie, Rankin is the leech of despair. Yeah, like in the movie show, so-and-so is this. It's like Rankin is the leech of despair. And so Solaritus says, oh, we're going to have to give some thought to this. Like we have to figure out how are we going to use that ability? Like how are we going to use that ability that he flies right in? And the thing I like about this is that sometimes we find out we have an ability and it takes a little while to figure out how are we going to use this? Like where, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to do this? And then... Will makes a mistake. And I think this is a really important part of the story because I think this, I think you could make the argument that this is the first real error that Will makes. And um, I'm curious about, um, ooh, Alexis, I'm so with you. I sometimes forget Solaris is a dragon too. I forget that too. All right, um, so do you guys agree? Can you think of anything? Can you think of anything else that, that Will Lawrence has done that you may think of as a mistake? Up to this point, this is the first one that I could see that I would say um, is a is a mistake. And I found this to be, it's like, friendship is so weird. You just pick a human you met and you're like, yep, I like this one. And you just do stuff with them. And I think that's true, but I think it backfires. It backfires on Lawrence because, and I think it's natural, right? They come from the same background and there's this instant bond, this instant friendly attraction because they're from the same background they have the same manners that he, he feels comfortable with him he feels more at home with him and he's in this very different environment that doesn't feel safe that doesn't feel like home and so I think it's natural but it is a mistake and it isn't just a mistake because we find out later that Rankin is the leech of despair it's a mistake right here because you're judging somebody on false assumptions. You're judging somebody based on things that are not enough to really make a judgment for. Um, okay, so Mark C. says uh, the way he treated his girlfriend at breakfast was a mistake for him. Maybe, maybe, maybe his mistake, Kira, being the, a bit harsh with Granby. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, both of those are really good ones. Those are really good ones. Okay, so we need a name. For this literary device because I tried to think of it seriously for about like an hour. I was like, what is that? What would it be called? And I was like searching on Google. And what I'm looking for is something to call it when. Okay, so you guys know what what dramatic irony is, right? That's when I know something as a reader or a viewer and the characters don't know, right? So I know you shouldn't go in the cave because the monster is waiting in there. 
or I know that your boyfriend is cheating on you and you don't know, right? That's dramatic irony. What I want to name for is when the author knows, and I'm not talking about suspense. I'm just talking about that the author knows that something's going to be important later, but the reader doesn't know. It, and it's it's not dramatic irony, and it's also not really foreshadowing because no normal reader would pick up on it. Like in foreshadowing, foreshadowing is almost always a little bit more obvious. I'm looking for when it's like, whoa, I, I didn't realize what was coming. And we have that here. We have that, that they make this instant connection and become friends, but then later on, um, that later on that's a problem. Ooh, so Andrew's throwing down some uh, personality spoilers for Rankin. So, but I like the um, I like the insight that just because someone is a bad trainer and a bad friend doesn't mean he's a bad person. Um, if you read in his character some more, okay. But I'm gonna hold out one thing that I I don't know. I don't know. There's something that's gonna happen later that makes me feel like no, I don't like this guy. Um, Okay, so if any of you have any ideas, like building irony, suspenseful irony, yeah, it is definitely planning out a book, but I'm just kind of curious. Um, yeah, anyway, so I'm gonna be watching in this. Okay, so here's a moment of surprise. Here's a moment of surprise, and there's this awkward moment where Will Lawrence just assumes something, right? He assumes that everybody's guys, and so he sees what he wants to see, or he sees what he anticipates seeing. Um, he meets Catherine Harcourt and this begins, well, it doesn't really begin, but this continues some of the commentary that we get in, the, in this book on the British social mores and the way that they treat women. We've seen it already. There's actually going to be another part. I don't, I didn't put it in the slides for today, but there's a part where he's like, oh, uh, he says, who, I think it's Rankin who says it. Yeah, Rankin says, oh, Lord Pugh has finally managed to marry off his daughter. It's just this dismissiveness of women, and it's kind of interesting. And the, I think the real commentary begins. Omnipresent irony. You know, I think it would be omniscient rather than omnipresent, all, like all-knowing instead of all-present, but omniscient irony. So maybe it's just author omniscience. I don't know. I need a name. Yeah. Okay. And... And then Catherine tells him, oh, long wings won't take male handlers. And I'm like, you know what? I ain't buying this. And you know me. I'm a big believer in challenge the author, challenge the teacher, challenge everything. And I'm going to challenge her on this. She says, long wings won't take male characters. If long wings won't take male handlers, I said characters, if long wings won't take male handlers and and that's a thing, right? And they then anybody who's handling them has to be female. How, can, how are you gonna keep that a secret? How are, you, how are you gonna keep that a secret? Like, people are gonna know, like how did families explain where the women disappeared to? I mean, is this really something you could keep a secret? I did not buy this. I'm curious, did any of you guys feel like, I don't know, I, I didn't buy it. Okay, <laughs> so activate your believability detector now. So if you think it's totally believable, give it a five. If, you, if you're with me and you're like, I am buying it, that's a one. And if you're like, maybe, then give it a three. So activate your believability detector. Do you think that if all along long wings can't be handled by women, or sorry, can't be handled by men, that they have been able to keep that secret from the general public forever, even in a day and age with no social media? I ain't buying it. But you guys, I'm interested. Okay, so some of you are like, eh. no, it doesn't seem that anybody is as skeptical as I am yet, so I'm curious. Some of you are like, yeah, they can make it happen. Okay, oh, Jason is a minus two, so definitely even more skeptical than I am. All right, so remember, we're looking for friendship, we're looking for luck, we're looking for strategy, and we have friendship here. I could desire no better society than Temeraire's, and it is as much for my own sake as his that we are engaged, just love it. And then another, and he says, and then um, Temeraire says this, I suppose it's because I'm a Chinese dragon. Dragons have a system of ranking among themselves, right? This idea that, um, I, I just thought this was interesting. I, I put in a couple quotes here, that there was essentially racism among the dragons. And 
I, I wonder, is this a thing among all species? Like we know that animals will even kill their young if they think they're weak. They'll, they'll desert them, they won't accept them. Do, we, is, do you think it's like innate animal behavior to dislike or suspect the other? I don't know. Okay, Mark C, you guys are giving some good thing. They could play it off as a boarding school. Mark C says, remember they're kept remotely. Handlers aren't big news. How many are there? Right, maybe not. Um, they can't always tell. Okay, that's a good point. But where do the family say the kid went? I don't know. Um, the girls could have been born there. Yeah, maybe, but she's not. Um, anyway, so yeah, I think it is sad. Uh, I just saw somebody quote, I think Will, um, that it is sad that even among dragons, right? And then I love this line. I love this line from Temeraire. Perhaps France will have to invade us and then we'll have to fight. And he's all happy, right? Temeraire wants to go to battle. And I think that's a real thing, right? Like if you, if you practice and practice and practice and practice, even for something that's bad, like bomb disposal, or you know, you're a SWAT team. If you practice all the time, it's hard not to want a game day, right? I, Anyway, so I thought that was funny, and I it reminded me it reminded me of this scene in Lord of the Rings with with Gimli when Gimli is like certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for, right? And I think I just love this that like he wants like Temerary. He's only a few weeks old, and he's like, let me at him, right? Let me at him. Um, so, but then I felt bad about this. Okay, you guys, this is a screenshot of my family tree. Look at that last name right there. <laughs> so, I actually am a Rankin. My, my, I, my ancestors' last names were Rankin, and some of them. And so, you know, this guy is like a distant cousin. So, yes, Christine, like in Hamilton where he wants a war. Yeah, I think that's just, yeah, maybe human nature. Um, so, he says... Over the last few days, he had seen more evidence than he liked of Levitus's unhappiness and neglect. The little dragon watched anxiously for a handler who did not come. And I just, anyway, I thought that was sad. I wanted to look at, I wanted to look at Levitus for a second. So, um, first of all, Levitus is a Winchester dragon. That's the kind of dragon that he is. He's a Winchester. And I went and looked up, and there is a Winchester there's an elementary school in Michigan that is called Winchester Elementary, and their mascot is the dragons. And I thought, I wonder if they know that. Like, I wonder if they know that there are... Anyway, I, I was thinking, I need to send an email to their principal. Like, do you know that this is actually a thing? Um, but Levitus, the name Levitus, remember I've said Levitus, the names are always important. The names are always important. Um, and... Um, levitus means lightness or like from the word levity so like happy go lucky and there's this other second meaning of levitus which is like fickle inconstant and disloyal and what I think is interesting about this name is that I think it clues us in that um, that levitus would naturally be a happy go lucky character but then Rankin's behavior which is fickle, inconstant, and disloyal um, changes him as a dragon. So kind of interesting, I, I thought, anyway. Um, and then we get a clue. Remember, Will remembers that Rankin introduced himself without the name of his dragon. Everybody else he's met has been like so-and-so on such-and-such. -such. You know, I'm this handler on this dragon. And Rankin is the only one who is a dragon handler who has not named his dragon. And that was a clue. So kind of interesting. Okay. And then this beautiful quote from, beautiful, beautiful quote from Temeraire. It's very nice how many books there are indeed and on so many subjects. And again, some more dragon wisdom, beauty of the book. And then, and this is Will and he's, he's talking about Rankin's attitude toward the dragon. And he says, if he'd been willing to defend his philosophy, it could have been a sincere wrong-headed position. But clearly it was not. He was only consulting his own ease. And these remarks were merely excuses for the neglect he performed. So it was like, not that he, um, 
not that Rankin truly believed, no, dragons are inferior, dragons don't need this. He's just flippant. He's just flippant. He is, he is not taking seriously something that Will thinks very seriously about. And this is when Will really starts to turn. He's like, wait a minute. You don't even have a good answer. Like, you're not even giving it any consideration. You're just being, you're just being a jerk. Okay. Um, and then we have a whale of a word, inured. So, inured, I love, I love this word. And I wanted to say it because I think it's an important word to know. I think this is one of the words to put in your personal dictionary. So, what inured means is to become used to something to become used to something unpleasant like hardship or challenge or pain or people not liking you or something like that. It comes from two separate words, in and your, U-R-E, in, your, meaning in use or in practice. So um, I wanna give you some practice with it. So remember, inured, to become inured or is to become used to something that is hard to get used to. So. Um, I want your ideas. I have. I want you to fill it in. I have become inured to. So tell me something that you've become used to that is unpleasant, painful, you don't like it, it's challenging, or it's hard, or it's, you know, any of those things. What's something that you've become inured to? Um, inured to people not liking me? Okay, yeah, I, I've, I've got that too. Um, in your, I'm watching for some of these to come in. I can never marry someone with the last name Rankin. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Um, I'm looking for these. Being inured to quarantine. Yeah, I, th I think we are. Um, yeah, I think we're getting inured to quarantine, waiting for some of these to come in. Um, inured to having a lack of toilet paper. You know, it is, I, I don't know if I could ever adjust that, but I do know that when I go into the grocery store now, if they have everything I want, I'm like, oh, that's so cool, right? Like and you're to school, and you're to wearing masks, okay, and you're to your French teacher. We will not tell him. Um, Alexis, and you're to living in Texas where it's very hot. Yes, it's true, but you don't have to shovel it like snow. And you're to vacuuming, gardening, folding the laundry. I don't know why you guys do that capital lowercase thing. It's weird. And you're to your annoying sister. We won't tell her you said that. And you're to having to brush your teeth. Yeah, you just get used to it, and you're to dealing with Rankin. Okay. Now I want to know something you will never get used to. No matter how long it goes on, you will never get used to it. You will never accept it. You will always be like raging against the machine. You'll never get used to it. What will you never get inured to? Let me see. Um, let's see. I hope you don't get inured to being scolded by your parents to get off the computer because, you know, that's a real thing. You should get off the computer. <laughs> So yeah, Texas is amazing. Techno cow, he's back to techno cow. We really loved it when you were at the the moose. That was awesome. Um, let's see. I never become near to wearing a mask. Yeah, your demon dog. Ooh. Um, let's see. Your cast. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You're in a cast. Oh, that's the worst. And they itch. Hot. I'll never become to near to anti Disney and Marvel people. That's funny. Oh, it indicates sarcasm, does it? Okay, I didn't know that, Cloudfall. Yeah. Having no friends in Texas. Oh, you'll make friends. You'll make friends once this is over. Um, inured to not having the fourth book of the series. Like, you need it, right? Inured to the class ending. Oh. Inured to a lack of books. Yeah, definitely. Inured to racism. That's a good thing not to get inured to. So those are cool. Um, all right. Well, you guys have done some good, good work there. So good job, peeps. All right, and Will realizes, Will comes to the realization that he's made a mistake with Rankin and that by befriending Rankin and getting so closely um, tied to Rankin, he's damaged his relationship with the other guys and, and girls there. And I think that this is this humble side of Will that we really haven't seen before very often. We see it sometimes, but not very often. And we saw it when he asked Temeraire about the harness and if it was bothering him. And we see it again here. We've seen it in his attitude toward Edith where he understood why she wouldn't want to come with him and why she wouldn't want to get engaged to him. And here it is again. But even more than this, I think there's just this beautiful, um, beautiful, beautiful life lesson here that if you make a mistake, you just have to own it. You just have to own it and you have to make a decision to change 
And you have to move forward with that, even if nobody ever accepts him. He he can and will alter his behavior. I love that. That is a total life lesson right there, you guys. And then, and then Temeraire saying, I'm sure I would not have liked any French captain half so much as you. And I just love these, these little moments of, yes, be like Will. That's a good one. Be like Sam, be like Will. That's good. That's good. Thank you for that one. Um, thank you for that. So I love the friendship that we see growing. And it, it's very similar to friendship in another story. So this is a song they've made at a movie. I'm showing you a little clip from. It's a book and it's um, Puff the Magic Dragon. And, and there are lots of stories where there's these friendships between humans and dragons. But this friendship between Will and Temeraire reminds me of, of that. So, but I, that is actually not this one. This is a different movie. This isn't Puff the Magic Dragon. This is a different one. I don't know if you guys recognize it. Um, so, and then he says, I'm sure we'll be able to puzzle it out together, whatever it is. And I think this is a nice one because it's wisdom and it is also friendship. And the chapter ends with this. And so I want to go to the end of this chapter because Novik is this master of this. This is like her thing, right? Like if you... Yeah, this is Pete. That was Pete's dragon. Yeah, I didn't think anybody would recognize that. Um, so, uh, the Novik ends chapters always, always. There's something important at the end of the chapter. She uses this this pattern of super strong closing moments, and not only do they leave you with an event, they leave you with a feeling, and I I think it's a real skill of hers. All right, chapter seven. All right, so this is so interesting because I don't know if any of you noticed this, but the, the way that they hook themselves on to the harnesses of the dragon are, are with um, these clips. And I decided to go look, look them up. I was like, did they really have those then? Where did they come from and when did they come from? And I looked it up and the meaning is from a German word Kara Binnerhaken, Kara Binnerhaken, honey, how would you, do you talk, how would you pronounce that? Uh, in Auf Deutsch, in German, I would probably say Kara, Kara Binnerhaken. Kara Binnerhaken. Yeah, that's how I would say, ah, oh, good, okay, Kara Binnerhaken, or spring hook. And um, so that's where it came from. And it, and it was first invented on the eve of World War I by a German guy named Otto Herzog. And, um, but they were, the, the carabiners or carabiniers were a French soldier, a special French soldier um, that came up in the 1600s. But that's what this is named after. So there you go. Learn something new every day. Well, almost every day. Okay, this is an interesting see, thing that we see. We get another clue of Temeraire's intelligence. And we're going to see more and more of it. And our attitude will start to shift. We have to shift the way that we've seen Temeraire. Because until now, he's been the one that Will cared for, right? Like, he's, he's Will's responsibility. Will's looking out for him. Will's caring for him. And we're going to see this shift as, um, like, Temeraire is not a child. Temeraire is not dependent on Will. Temeraire is his own uh, dragon, I guess, and he is a powerful force, and we have to adjust the way that we see him. Temeraire is absolutely a dynamic character. And, the, okay, okay, I, I had trouble seeing this in my mind. This is on page 181, if you have this copy of the book, but in this copy of the book, on page 181, it was talking about the tense, and he said, they did not have the tents aboard, so we couldn't have them practice going to quarters and breaking down full gear. But they did well enough at the rigging changes, and he thought they would have done well even with the additional equipment. And I was like, how big are these dragons? Like, you pitch a tent on the dragon? I went and looked at the descriptions of, like, how big the size was supposed to be. And they said that the little dragons, the Winchesters, like Lebedus, were about the size of a draft horse. So like a really big, like Clydesdale type horse. I wouldn't pitch a tent on a Clydesdale. So I don't understand. I, I could not, I couldn't, I couldn't picture that in my mind. Even, even thinking about a big dragon. I, I don't know how many of you got stuck on that. I, I got stuck on that for a while. Um, 
I don't know, maybe I need to activate my believability detector. So I love this. Um, Will starts to think of all, he said, all the many ways in which an excellent first lieutenant could improve the life of a crew, and Granby was now proven capable of them all. But that only made his early attitude more regrettable. Just like we have to shift our opinions and our views of Temeraire, as he is displays himself as a dynamic character who's changing, the same is true of Granby. Granby is a secondary character, but he's a very... He's, he's a dynamic character. Remember that little character box we looked at where you can be flat and dynamic or round and dynamic or flat and static or flat and dynamic, although that's really unusual. We have to shift our view of Lieutenant Granby. And here is Will implying that in some ways it would have been better if Granby were bad at his job, right? He could have just ignored him more. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe the... Oh, Okay. The dragons were the size of how, yeah, it's kind of weird. Some were, I guess some are bigger and some aren't. I don't know. I still can't picture it. Okay, so there's this scene. There's this scene on page 187. I took a picture of my actual book. That's my actual book. That's actually me sitting in the chair reading. In the background of that picture, you can see the door going out to my backyard. Um, I took a picture of where I wrote, wow. Um, and this was just this scene where Will almost falls off the dragon. He almost plummets to his death. And, and Timurera is like, Lawrence, hold on. And heads turn and, and he's, and he's getting ready to grab Will out of the air. And Will's like, you must not let him fall, right? Timurera, you must not. It was just like such a powerful moment. I was just like, oh, like there was just so much suspense, so much tension. And I just love the way that the author built this up. Uh, anyway, I just I just love that moment. And he he locked his loose clips onto the ring of Granby's harness. And I think this is the moment. This is the moment when Granby says this to Will. When Granby saves Will's life, this is the moment when our view of Granby really changes. Like we've already been prepared for it. We've already had that pump primed a little bit because we realize he's good at his job. But now he saves Will's life. Now he saves Will's life. And um, so I think, I think that's really cool. And Granby goes from being an enemy to being the person who saved his life and probably the lives of the dragons as well. So I thought this was just an incredible moment. And um, at the end of it, Will does not feel calm. He's, he, you know, he doesn't feel calm. Um, yeah, I think I actually skipped a slide. There it is. He was shaking as if he'd been on a deck through a three-day gale, right? As if he'd been on the on the ship. This is simile. And his heart was thundering in his breast. But on the outside, he's cool, calm, and collected. And I think that's what leadership is, right? Leadership is, doesn't matter what you're feeling inside, you put forward the view that I got this under control, right? So uh, then we have this moment. Right, we have this moment where Will has to make a decision about who is going to be his lieutenant. And he's like thinking about everything that's happened. He's thinking about all the lieutenants he's tried out. And he decides to take a risk on Granby. He decides, to, and we see this part of his personality where he's willing to set aside his own feelings and what's best for him um, personally for what's best. And he's like, so Magic 8 Ball. Who should I make my lieutenant? Should it be Granby? Should I make Granby my lieutenant? And the Magic 8 Ball says, I better ask again. <laughs> that one said Outlook not so good. The Magic 8 Ball says, Outlook good. <laughs> Outlook good. Yeah, you should make it. And, and Will, Will, again, one more. Um, Will, I had to take my frozen, um, this used to sing, I need to replace the battery, but my frozen microphone, which I use in class, whenever whenever a character needs to let it go, right? That's what Will has to do. You got to let it go, right? Because Granby's the guy. Granby's the guy. You got to bring him on no matter what, no matter what's what happened in the past. You got to let it go, right? All right. So next. Granby looked relieved and happy, and when Lawrence tentatively inquired for his recommendations for other officers, like, I don't know, how's it going to work? Like, should I ask him his opinion? Science point to yes, right? Like, ask him his opinion, see what happens, but he's a little trepidatious about it. Ooh, trepidatious. 
good word, add it to your dictionary. Uh, he answered with great enthusiasm. And it's like this, th they've broken the spell of the bad relationship, right? All right. And that's how the, the chapter ends. And that is Novik's superpower is to end every chapter with this feeling moment. All right. Last chapter of today. He was conscious of having proven himself. This is Will. Um, and, um, having proven himself and having helped Timurair to do the same and of a, the deep satisfaction of having found a true and worthy, I think it's worthy place for the both of them. I think it's an English teacher fail for those of you who like to celebrate those. I think we have an English teacher fail here. Um, where is it? Let's see. I don't know where I put it, but okay. Sometimes if it is an English teacher fail, there we go. But sometimes knowing that you did something good for someone else is almost better than knowing that you did something good for yourself. And I think Will's feeling that in this moment. I love this. This was, I think, my favorite quote. It, it stopped me in my tracks when I read this. It, and this is Temeraire. And Will is like, thank you for obeying me, right? Thank you for obeying me. And Temeraire says, because you are worthy of being obeyed. You would never treat me unkindly and you would never ask me to do something dangerous or unpleasant without cause. So not only is this dragon wisdom, but I, I, this just, I, I sat there and thought about this for a long time. The idea of being worthy of being obeyed. And I thought about that in my relationship with students when I'm a teacher, like, and I realized this is kind of hard to confront, but the truth is, is that if ever I've had a situation in a classroom go south, like where a kid got totally out of control and didn't. In elementary school, when that happens, it's not as big of a deal when the kids are little. Like when I was teaching third grade, that's not that big of a deal. But when you're teaching 11th or 12th graders and a kid gets violent in class, that can go down really fast. Like that escalated quickly, right? And I thought to myself, every single time that a student refused to obey me, it was because I was not behaving in a way that I was worthy to be obeyed. And I loved this idea. And I have a question for you about it, which is who in your life is worthy of being obeyed and who expects to be obeyed but isn't worthy of it and i was thinking sometimes that when people ask us to do stuff like our parents or whatever and maybe we don't want to do that thing i think this is such a good question to ask ourselves is this person worthy of being obeyed and if the answer is yes then we have to do it right because temeraire it's dragon wisdom, right? So the next time that happens to you where like your parents ask you for something and you and you don't want to do it, just think hashtag dragon wisdom, right? Dragon wisdom and do it. But I'm just just curious. Um, who is <laughs> Will, Mrs. Van in a booming voice? I am worthy of being obeyed. Yeah, I get my big thunder tube. I don't have it right here, but I get my big thunder tube. Brr, I'm worthy of being obeyed. Yeah. Um, Parents are worthy of being obeyed. Science teachers not worthy. It's interesting, isn't it? How teachers sometimes demand to be obeyed, but don't always earn it. So kind of interesting. I'm looking at some of these. Um, yeah, I'm kind of curious. Band teacher. Yeah, I'm noticing that some of you are saying like that it's not, that sometimes teachers are and sometimes there's not. Voldemort is not worthy. You know what, Lauren? That's a good call. That's a good call. It, Voldemort has all these followers, the Death Eaters, but he's not worthy of being obeyed. He's not. Oh, that is so good. That is so good. All right. And Timurair, Will says, you have to promise me you won't do that again. You Like my life as Will Lawrence is not as important as that dragon's life and all those other people. You have to agree to obey me. And... Tamara says, I can't promise such a thing. I'm sorry, I will not lie to you. I cannot have let you fall. You may value their lives above your own. I cannot do so. For to me, you are worth far more than all of them. Oh, it's just beautiful. Like, oh, uh, the friendship in this novel, like the friendship, the power of friendship. Like, would you sacrifice others for your beloved? Right. And I don't mean beloved in the like the like romantic love sense, but in the in the like platonic sense. Yeah. And then Solaritus explains um, 
why they can't allow um, Rankin, like why they allow Rankin to behave the way that he does. And he says that, you know, if we if we let Dragon say, I won't work for that guy anymore, then you could have you would have lieutenants who want to be captains. So captains are ones who are dragon handlers. Um, you would have them like trying to get the drag. Ooh, I'll give you this and I'll promise you that. And then there would be chaos. And so I had actually to this point thought, why don't they 86 this guy? Like get rid of this jerk. But I think Solaritus makes a good point here and I totally bought it. My dis my disbelievability, my believability detector was not activated by this at all. Um, and we also get insight into how hard it is on the cap on the dragon when the captain dies from this scene with Solaritus. Our dragon's name, Aaron, is Serignus, named by our very own Cloudfall. All right, so let's play real versus not real in this story. Real versus not real. Um, we've got a lot of realness. Ooh, um, we've got a lot of real things and unreal things. And I'm curious about um, if, let's guess. Okay, so we have this character, Villa Nueve, um, or Villa Nueve, probably really Villa Nueve. Real or not real. And he's real. He's a real guy. His name was Pierre Charles Jean Baptiste Sylvester de Villa Nueve. And he was in command of both the Spanish and French fleets, fleets at the Battle of Trafalgar. He had fought in the um, American Revolutionary War. Um, and he, he had this whole plan to draw off the British defenses by sailing to the West Indies, where he would combine with a Spanish fleet and French fleet from Brest and attack British possessions in the Caribbean. So there you go. Um, and... Okay, Anna says it's Voldemort, literally French for flight from death. <gasps> Anna, I speak French and I never picked up on that. <gasps> oh, whoa. I never separated out the syllables. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm just hung up on that. Okay, real, not real. All right, now you can guess real or not real. The Battle of Cape St. Vincent that he mentions Real or not real? Real. It's actually real. It's a real battle. The Battle of St. Vincent was a naval battle. It took place off the coast of Portugal in 1780 during the American Revolutionary War. So it was actually an American battle. And a British fleet defeated a Spanish fleet. And it's sometimes referred to, and you can see that in this painting a little bit, it's referred to as the Moonlight Battle because it was... Um, fought at night and that is very unusual for naval battles at that time um and it was the first major naval victory for the british uh over their enemies so that was pretty interesting so you can impress your history teacher all right real or not real is dover a real place real or not real i'll give you a couple seconds real this is it Dover, this is a picture, this is a photograph of Dover taken from France. This is how close England is to France. So when you're learning your European history, and I strongly recommend that you all take AP European history, when you do your European history, when you, all this tension between England and France is very understandable when you see how close they are. Um, and Dover is famous for its white cliffs, the white cliffs of Dover, and you can see them up here. You can see them up here in the background um, and close up. They're really impressive. So Dover is real. Real or not real, the Yellow Emperor. Couple seconds. Real or not real. Yeah, I'll say it. Voldemort. Yeah, you would leave off the T in French, Voldemort. Yellow Emperor, real or not real? Well, he's real-ish. <laughs> he's real-ish. Okay, so... The Yellow Emperor was a mythological hero who was in myth the like ancestor of all Chinese and the um, and the initiator of Chinese culture. So real ish. All right, um, real or not real? The Japanese dragon Raiden who drove Kublai Khan away. And this one is false. Ish. 
So Kublai Khan twice did attempt to invade Japan, but both times really what defeated him was the weather, not a dragon, um, and flawed design of ships that were based on rivers. Um, and so they didn't have keels because they're used to sailing on rivers. Um, Raiden was the god of thunder and lightning to the Japanese, so he was a real god, but he had nothing to do with Kublai Khan. All right, Zhao Sheng, the... Emperor's minister who swallowed a pearl from a dragon's treasury and became a dragon himself. Real or not real. And this one is false-ish. So Sheng Zhao, put the other way, so not Zhao Sheng, but Sheng Zhao is a real thing. It's the Chinese zodiac. You've probably all heard of this before. Like if you're born in the year of the rat or the year of the dragon or the year of the horse or the year of the dog. And there are 12 animals and every it cycles through. So um, rat, ox, tiger, rabbit, dragon, snake, horse, sheep, monkey, rooster, dog, and pig. And so you can, and that whatever animal you're born under, like if you're born in the year of the dragon, that's called your Sheng Zhao. Um, Sheng means your year of birth and Zhao means resemblance. So you're like, you're, you are a dragon. So I took a screenshot. These are all celebrities who were born in the year of the dragon. So Ron Weasley is a dragon. His Sheng Zhao is a dragon. Um, anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. Next, Schwazul, the character Schwazul. Um, oh, Will is mad. Um, of, about the ishes. Hey, I just, you know, I don't make the facts up. I just call it like I see it. Choiseul, and here's our beautiful French again. Um, so Choiseul, this one is one is like, I don't know. This is the Duke de Choiseul, and he was a real person. And he's actually a really important character in French history, but he was not the same Choiseul. So the this guy, it was largely things that he's responsible for bringing Marie Antoinette to France. He's the one who negotiated the marriage contract that had Marie Antoinette become the um, the queen of France. And the Choiseul name is very well known. There are still places in France named after him um, and they were wealthy aristocrats. So that idea that Choiseul um, was a, from a wealthy family in France, that's part's true, but this individual, no. All right, so we're done with our real, not real game. And what we have here is a board to Marais. He's bored because of his intelligence. And we see this again, that your strength is a struggle. And I think a lot of people can relate to this. The, of, of, um, of like when your strength is a struggle, that the same thing that makes you strong also causes you problems. Um, and they read that book, that book that um, Sir Howe gives them about Chinese dragons really makes him feel better because it, he sees the Chinese dragons and they look like him. They've got this stuff coming off their jaw. They've got this stuff coming up off the top and he doesn't look like the English dragons, but seeing that other people look like him is that. And I, I loved this, that he had a healthy respect for luck and Bonaparte seemed to attract a greater share than most generals. And I thought this is so interesting. So remember when uh, this prism through which we're looking at the novel of friendship, luck, and strategy. And I think that um, when I picked the things that we were going to look for in the novel, I had not yet read it. So I was just like, let's look for friendship, luck, and strategy. And that was it. And I haven't really seen very much strategy. There's been very little, but there has been a lot of friendship and a lot of luck. And one thing I know about reading is that you will find what you're looking for. So one of the things that I would say to you is you can read this same book again, pick three different things to look for, and you will find evidence of them. Even if your teacher doesn't give you something to look for in a novel before you read it, pick them for yourself. Look for the ways that people lie to each other. Look for any of those things. Look for fear. Look for love. Look for forgiveness. Look for grudges. Um, anything, anything like that. If you do that, it will anchor you. It will anchor you. Um, and then it says, Choiseul says this kind of casually. Yeah, I can't go back to France. 
under charge of treason now. But treason was punishable by death. It was capital punishment. So it's no real surprise that Choiseul does not want to go back to France if Napoleon intends to execute him. So, and he's, Choiseul is like a man without a country, right? Because he was, he's French. But then he had to flee to Austria during the revolution because of his family. And now he's had to flee because Napoleon hates him too. So it's really tricky. Um, and there's a little bit of French here for Anna. And we have this moment of shock where Temeraire just starts parlaying the Francais. He just starts speaking French. But more important than that, he's instructing Will in manners. So he's like, he, so this is where he's introducing himself to Choiseul's dragon. And Choiseul's like, oh, and this is my handler. And, and then here comes Temeraire. Oh, and here, this is, and here, Lawrence, like here's Lawrence, mine. This Le Mien is mine. So, and then he says, Lawrence, pray bow. Like he's like, he's just like all of a sudden speaking French. And, and Lawrence is shocked that Temeraire speaks French. But Solaritus is more surprised that he speaks English. So interesting. So interesting. And, and Solaritus says this, he's a little too intelligent to be an ideal formation fighter. And my special my specialty in teaching is gifted and talented. And I know this uh, gifted and talented kids also are not ideal formation fighters. Um, I don't know if any of you have, you know, this issue, but they're not designed to find formation. So I'm curious about something that you have, you have to do that may be boring because they adjust to this. They adjust to flying in the formation, even though it's boring. So I'm curious, what's something you have to do but might be boring, but knowing why you're doing it makes it okay. So so this is something that Choiseul says and, and, and will really get something out of it. He really does. And these were the circumstances which first gave him the notion of explaining formation tactics to Temeraire. And Temeraire, again, with the intelligence. And I feel like uh, this is where I want to give the author a little pushback. Like, okay, okay, we get it. He's smart. He doesn't have to be the best at everything, but he immediately gets it and they start making up their own maneuvers. Um, and they signal formation go aloft, which of course is not a real naval signal, but there we go. Um, and the chapter and section end here where they're going off to their first battle and they fly these flags, formation go aloft. Now before, the naval flags had summoned Will. Remember, Captain, report aboard. And now what we have are the naval flags summoning them to battle. And I think that's an interesting juxtaposition where it, it's just kind of cool. It's just kind of cool with the flags. Love it. Okay, got a little challenge for you guys. Got a little, little one. So what I would like you to do is to go to, I'm going to give you the link in a second. And I've created this document and I want to know what you have learned and or loved in the class. And you feel free to comment on each other's as well. And I put my first one in and you will find that here. Um, bit.ly Mrs. Van hyphen end. Um, I want to, I really am looking forward to reading what you've gotten out of the class. And it doesn't have to be just this this novel, but any any of it ever since we started, which seems crazy when we started in March. So I'm very curious. And um, for next week, read chapters nine through the end, looking for luck, friendship, and strategy. And that's it. So I will see you next week, same bat time, same bat channel. This is Mrs. Van, your friendly neighborhood English teacher, signing off.